This is Duke University. So I am Kathy Clark, Director of the Case Library Initiative on Impact Investing, um, and I want to welcome you to tonight's talk. We are live streaming, just so you're all aware. Uh, so I'm going to tell, I'll tell you a little bit about Case I3. Um, Case I3 is one of the most comprehensive programs at a top business school that's blending academic rigor with uh, practical knowledge in the emerging field of impact investing. Impact investing, as many of you know, is the act of investing for both financial return and positive social impact. Investments in healthcare, education, uh, renewable energy, poverty alleviation, all of these can be done in ways that make money and make a difference. So Case I3 is our initiative here at the Duke School of Business at Duke University, and we've been around since September 2011. And in the past four years, the field of impact investing has grown significantly. The idea is spreading like wildfire, uh, from boardrooms of major corporations and foundations, state budget offices, international development agencies, investment banks, wealth managers, and pension funds. In the private markets, this activity was estimated to encompass $60 billion in assets under management in 2014. If you count the public markets um, of sustainable and responsible investing, we're looking at a market of $6.57 trillion. New studies report that over 50% of millennial and baby boom investors want to integrate impact into their portfolios in the next decade. So impact investing might be the financial trend of the 21st century. Case, I see, Case I3's role in this development market has been diverse and active over the last four years. We've educated thousands of students, partnered with over 100 organizations globally, convened hundreds of practitioners at events, produced over 25 reports, books, and case studies, educated global leaders about impact investing in customized seminars, joined with the U.S. White House and other leaders to develop policy recommendations for the field domestically and globally, and we've supported the development of academic research in 13 other universities. Our alumni are actively building this field with us across the globe, and we actually believe that this is just the beginning. Um, last February, some of you may have been here when the U.S. Secretary of Labor, Thomas Perez, spoke here at Fuqua and shared his unrelenting optimism about how sustainable business, social impact, and leaders of consequence will be the core of a thriving economy. We agree. Um, tonight, we have a chance to step out of our day-to-day -day work, look at this field from the experience of our friends in the UK, who are experienced architects of financial innovation, who also have a strong sense of public purpose. Um, many of you know that some of the most fundamental concepts of impact investing came out of the microfinance field um, in Bangladesh. Um, today, microfinance is a 70 billion global market. You may not be aware that a small group of leaders in the UK have been working to institutionalize a global capital market that can more regularly and sustainably support social entrepreneurs like Mohammed Yunus, the founder of Grameen Bank, one of the first um, microfinance institutions. Among those leaders, one of the most active over the past decade has been our guest speaker tonight, Nick O'Donnell. Nick brings a traditional pedigree to non-traditional work. Most of his career was within investment banking. He was at Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan for over 30 years. At J.P. Morgan, his last post was global head of research. There, together with someone we at Fuqua know quite well, my colleague, Professor John Bewley, Nick helped establish J.P. Morgan's new social finance unit. Saying that this field would not exist as it is today without Nick um, is rather an understatement. He published the first research report on the market size and potential of impact investing with the Rockefeller Foundation in 2010. He's been an active board member at key backbone institutions in the field, such as the Global Impact Investing Network. The, he's served as chairman of the World Economic Forum Social Innovation Council and as chair of the G8 UK Social Impact Investment Advisory Group. Um, as well as serving on our own Case I3 advisory board. He holds an MBA from Wharton. Most significantly, he helped create and build Big Society Capital, a novel financial intermediary in the UK that has catalyzed over 370 million pounds of investment in social enterprises by using dormant bank assets from top banks as a leverageable pool of investment capital for a public purpose. 
After five years of working to get Big Society off the ground and turn it from an idea into a thriving enterprise, um, I think he's got some important lessons to share with us. Clearly, others think he does. He announced earlier last month that in January, he'll be stepping down from Big Society to work with the Gates Foundation on their impact investing activities in London. Um, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Duke. It's my first time, but uh, my uh, friend and colleague, former colleague, John Bewley, has been trying to get me here for quite a period of time. So it is great to be able to, to come and uh, at speak at what is such a, a prestigious business school and also uh, a business school, I think, that's made such a significant contribution and commitment to this field. Um, I want to start. Uh, today in the UK, uh, there are single mothers in coming out of with their children out of temporary accommodation into permanent accommodation thanks to investments made by social investors. Um, there are old people in old people's homes having exercise classes thanks to companies sponsored by, uh, by social investors. There are uh, people with learning disabilities who, having, who are moving to, to um, uh, 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 who have better choices of where they live. There, is a, uh, there are uh, uh, young <coughs> Uh, children in deprived areas with access to nursery care that they didn't have before. There are dementia patients that are living independently when they wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to do that. And I could go on and on and through a lot of those examples. Uh, but the point I want, I, I wanted to start with that because I want to make an important point. And if you only remember one thing about what I say, remember this one. This starts, this whole impact investing movement that Kathy spoke so vocally about, starts with people and it starts with issues, and it starts with um, how we can help use capital to address those issues. And I, I say that because sometimes too many of the, of the presentations and too many of the reports I, I, I've uh, indeed I've, uh, admittedly been personally involved with some of, they start with finance and they start with new ways of, uh, of um, new financial products and new ways of, of structuring financial products. And really that's not what this movement is about. And I think if we if we, if, we, if we lose sight of the beneficiaries, uh, who we're trying to help, why we're trying to help them, and what we're trying to do, then this field will never grow as, uh, in the way that uh, I think we all um, uh, hope it will. So with that as sort of a context, let me tell you, I wanted to spend the time talking about what we've done in the UK, um, what part that Big Society Capital, which is the organization I've been chief executive officer for, of, for the last four years, what part we've played, why this particular role that we play is important, why we hope it's, uh, it's in the process of being copied in, in a number of countries in the world, and why I think also be, uh, would be potentially a very important in terms of augmenting uh, the uh, impact investment uh, market here. For, I want to start just again in terms of context by talking about where we fit in this sort of spectrum. Most of you would have seen this slide before. It's one that was produced uh, by uh, the task force, the G8 task force that, um, that uh, Cathy referred to. And it goes across the whole spectrum of, of if you like, uh, fi from finance to philanthropy. Starts over uh, on the, your right hand side, my right hand side, with financial only which I think if we're honest, financial only, meaning we make investments to maximize our risk adjusted return and we don't really worry at all about what the, the sort of the externalities and the impacts of, impact is. Financial only makes up, I'm gonna say 90, 90% of, of, over 90% of investable assets today. But as we move across the spectrum, we move first into what I would describe, what we describe the sort of do no harm strategies. Uh, the, uh, the negative screen, ESG strategies, the more positive, sustainable investment strategies. Both of those are growing at a significant pace. Both of them are um, uh, potentially very important in terms of changing the way that, that companies work and, uh, um, and changing the way that investors invest their capital. Uh, but they're not impact investing. Impact investment is all about moving from do no harm to do some good. And um, the, the, the impact investing spectrum is made up of those uh, of, 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 of organizations that address societal challenges where investors believe that they can do, they can invest in those organizations without necessarily giving up any sort of return. Um, 
and then it moves into more of what we would describe as um, what we in, in, in the UK describe, I think, as the impact investment market, which is more those areas where you're supporting social organizations, principally social organizations in those areas where capital can seek to, to earn market, just, market uh, risk adjusted returns, but where that's much more difficult. And so the, 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 where we are, where BSC is, is in that last or those last two boxes. We're in the impact box, but we are very much in the support social, social sector organizations, uh, try to help connect them with capital, try to help them grow, try to help them reach more, uh, re reach more beneficiaries, except the fact that there is probably, at the margin, some, uh, um, uh, some financial price to be, to be paid uh, uh, for doing that. Um, our origins, as Kathy said, were, um, began actually in as, as long ago as 2000 when we were uh, one of the ideas that came out of what was called the Social Investment Task Force, which was uh, appointed by the previous, uh, by Gordon Brown, who was the pre at the time the Chancellor in the previous Labour government, chaired by Sir Ronald Cohen, um, who of all the leaders that Kathy talked about is really the, uh, in the UK, in this movement, is really the, the, uh, is really the, uh, uh, um, the true leader, chaired the G8, uh, G8, G8 task force. Um, uh, but Ronnie got involved in this movement in 2000, had uh, organized a social investment task force. They made a number of recommendations. One of those recommendations was that we should create in the UK an institution that was charged with the responsibility of developing the social investment market. Um, and that, um, and that what uh, and so, and the, and the funding that we should, and it was felt at the time that that organization needed to be uh, if it was to be successful, it needed to be well capitalized. Uh, so in about 2007, the UK government identified dormant bank accounts as being a way of, 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 um, of, of capitalizing that institution. And that uh, dormant bank accounts are accounts that have been left in banks and building societies for, in our case, more than 15 years. They're untouched uh, over that period of time. And, there's, uh, and the principle behind uh, I, uh, behind the uh, funding an organization like us with dormant accounts is the idea that at some point in time, if the money's been effectively lost and untouched, it should be used for public benefit. Um, so that was the capital that was used. Uh, that, uh, to date, there's been about 720 million pounds of dormant accounts identified in the UK and transferred to this organization called the Reclaim Fund, which is then used to, to uh, fund us. So that was um, the pool of capital identified in 2008 took about three or four years to collect the money, and then in about two, in, and we were launched, um, uh, I guess, the, the planning for BSC started in 2011, and we were formally launched as an organization in, in uh, 2012. Um, and our role is to build the market. So it's not actually to create a return from our money, although we're expected to preserve our capital. It's not even to create maximum impact with the money that we have, although we're expected to create some impact. It is to build the market. It's not meant, to be, it's not meant to, be, uh, to, to be a market. So in other words, it's not intended that our capital be the only capital. It's intended that we build the market and we draw in uh, um, uh, other um, uh, forms of capital through other co-investors. And so that's why on the chart, the dormant accounts, we also received um, separately, um, although still with, I think, strong encouragement from the government, 200 million pounds from the, from the uh, uh, large UK commercial bank. So we are truly a public-private partnership in the sense that we have this public money and we have this, uh, we have this private money. And we have a mission that is intended to try to, um, uh, as I say, grow this, uh, grow this investment market. We're, we, we work with other institutions. Uh, we work with foundations and big trusts. Uh, we work with mainstream financial organizations to try to bring them into our, into our investments. We're a wholesaler, which is an important distinction uh, um, which was imposed on us when we were set up. And a wholesaler means we don't deal directly with frontline organizations. We don't invest in, the com in companies. We don't lend money to charities. Or we don't <coughs> directly buy social impact bonds. Um, we do the, all these things indirectly through various, forms of, uh, through various forms of intermediaries. And those intermediaries then provide funding or support, other forms of support uh, for social sector organizations. Social sector organizations are defined as organizations that exist wholly or mainly for social purpose. That's another important distinction because that's not an easy thing. But one of the challenges of our industry is definitional. Uh, and defining what is a social organization, what is a social purpose company is a, really, uh, is a difficult thing to do. And I don't think ours is perfect. But certainly the, the 
the spirit of what we were set up for was to try to drive capital towards nonprofits, what we call community interest groups, some form of cooperatives, and private companies that are clearly identifiable through their mission, through their articles, through their, what they do with their surplus as, as profit with purpose companies. Um, so that was the, that's sort of the, the, uh, the design. We do broadly do two. We have today, um, as, uh, four years on, we have about 40 people who work for us. Um, we have uh, two major roles and two major, major groups within uh, BSC. One, is, uh, uh, one role is to act as a market championing, champion. That's doing a whole lot of stuff that we wouldn't otherwise do. If all we had to do was invest our capital, we wouldn't do this stuff. But we do it because it helps grow the market. Um, so we act as a, as a leading voice for impact investment. And again, you look at the, at the market here in the US, which all of you, I think, know much better, and you ask yourself, who is the leading voice for impact investment in the UK or in the US? Who's the first organization the government's going to turn to when they want input or advice? Who's the organization that has the principal um, uh, um, responsibility for convening the various stakeholders, whether they're social purpose companies or whether they're um, um, government or, uh, or whether they're the, sort of this intermediary layer. And I think um, most people would argue that organization doesn't exist in the, in the US. It maybe exists in multiple places and there are certainly some very effective foundations and others who have led the charge in terms of trying to build this market. But the idea of having one organization with the expertise, the experience and the balance sheet to build this market is really at the moment uh, quite unique in the UK. And so that's what we do. We spend money convening. We spend money trying to address some of the in infrastructure challenges around impact investment. So we invest, for example, in, 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 in data providers. Uh, we provide an important policy, um, I, what, I suppose, lobbying support for impact investment. So there are things that have happened alongside the foundation of BSC, whether it's the creation of the social investment tax relief, whether it's some of the other grant programs used to, to help capacity building in the sector. Um, these are all things that, again, we have in our role as big society capital, we have led the charge on. And I think that's a really, and I think people tend to look uh, first at what we do with our capital, they look at our balance sheet, they look at our investment portfolio. But equally as important, and possibly more important, is just having some organization that everybody turns to that has real experience, real expertise, real clout with government and, uh, and real clout with the stakeholders. And we fill that role in, in, in the UK. And I think most people uh, would concede it's, a, it's important. Um, but we do also as, have a balance sheet that is equally important. I remember, John will remember, when we set up the social finance group at JP Morgan, um, that was one of the key elements of, of, it wasn't just about let's have a few people that go around trying to find transactions and, and advise on transactions. It was, you know, uh, uh, um, um, in discussions with Jamie Diamond and others, we need a balance sheet, we need capital, because without capital, you're just not really ever going to be terribly important. So having that, we have what is, by the standards of the, of the, of the market in the UK, a significant amount of, of capital. Uh, both through our dormant accounts and through our investment from, um, from uh, the banks. I mean, to put it in perspective, we expect to end up with about £600 million of capital. comes in every year for about the first six or seven years of our sort of history um, existence. Um, so six or seven hundred million pounds, so about a billion dollars. I always think in the US-UK context, you're thinking sort of ten for one in terms of GDP and population and everything else. And so, te so that's equivalent to having a ten billion dollar pool of money in the US to support the growth of impact investment, to provide cornerstone fi funding for various, uh, for new fund managers to help entice existing mainstream managers into, into setting up funds, to make sort of targeted investments in new transactions. Because any of you who've ever tried to raise money, as some of you have, but many of you will, try to raise money for different, uh, uh, for, for, for uh, fund products, and you find, is that first it's getting the first cornerstone investor, particularly, by the way, if you're a first-time fund manager, you have no track record to point to, you have no existing investors. Getting those first, that first investor is really, really difficult. But when you find it, if they're a significant one, if they're a reputable one, if they're an organization that has a reputation for due, dili 
diligencing properly, that can then bring in a whole lot of people. And that was a big part of the driving sort of philosophy behind BSC was let's, ha let's be that cornerstone investor. So um, somebody came up to me before talking about mustard seed, who's borrowing somebody from mustard seed. From, mu from Mustard Seed is a great example of an organization that's recently been set up, but, ver but uh, as putting together sort of a, 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 a network of impact invest investors, want to start a fund, very difficult, to, without a tra great people, but without a track record. So how do you find that first, first organization to invest in your fund? Um, and that's why BSC is important, because we're willing to look past. P p I mean, we assess people, we assess the, the people that come to us, but to, of course, based on what they've done and uh, if they have a track record, but much more about what their motivations are, what their backgrounds are, what's their experience, both, <coughs> pro both their financial experience and their, and their sort of social sector experience. And then we make bets. And so almost everything, if you looked at our balance sheet, almost everything is uh, a large part of it is what looks like a fund of funds. Almost all the funds we've invested in have been first-time funds. They're we're typically 50% of all the funds we invest in. So, we're, we're, so again, if you want to build an impact investment market, you've got to have, or it really helps uh, to have somebody um, uh, sort of taking that, um, taking that lead. And then we have, I think, a lot of responsibility around being transparent in what we do because if markets grow based on um, real transactions, real transactions, D uh, generate real data, and real data is then used to really to help everybody assess the risks and returns of what they're doing. And we have the ability, again, because of our central role, um, a central role um, uh, to do that to, for the market. There were a couple of, uh, on BSC, a couple of design, important design functions that were built into us, built into the organization when we were launched, which I won't spend a lot of time on, uh, but I think we're quite important in terms of understanding what we do and why we do, do it. The first one is we're independent, and that's actually quite a big deal when you consider that most of our money comes through the government, not taxpayers' money, but government-directed money. Um, so for government to say, okay, we recognize that sort of politics and, and investment are probably sort of uh, uh, inconsistent, so we want you to be independent, um, and we're really going to leave you alone, let you invest in whatever you want to, take whatever direction you want to build this market. That's quite an important um, uh, consideration. It led to a lot of discussion around how you lock in a social mission in an organization like ours, which we do through, uh, uh, through a, a group of um, trustees. Um, the second one is, as I mentioned, we're a wholesaler. That was something that um, um, if uh, you know, we get, I mentioned earlier, we get, not a week goes by without us getting a deputation from some country in the world who wants to think about setting up an organization like ours. And they look at what we've done and they look at how we were set up. And sometimes it works, sometimes it works, some, you know, sometimes it works in their circumstance, whether it's Japan or Israel or Australia or wherever, and sometimes it doesn't. But one of the things we always say that is actually critical to our, um, uh, the way we're set up, and I think I would do again wherever we were doing this, is to be a wholesaler. Because the, you, you have, we, government could have taken a whole lot of money and plonked it alongside a whole lot of embryonic intermediaries and distorted the whole market. And you don't build a market by putting one big strong player alongside a whole lot of small ones. So they took the decision to put it on top and feed into all these organizations. And you build a market, and people like Monitor have done some very good work, reports on this, but you build a market by building this network of intermediaries and building an infrastructure around them. Uh, or an infrastructure in terms of data and information and, and um, expertise. And so that idea of building the intermediary layer and doing it, and intermediaries are investment managers, they're advisors, they're all sorts. But having that group uh, organization on top that feeds in money into them, I think is a, is a particularly important element to what we do. And as I say, it makes it easier, uh, feasible for in this really, because this impact investment market is really small, it's really, it's really embryonic, it's growing very quickly, but it does need, it needs sort of help. And, it, and so having that one, uh, that place to turn to, which can fund you when nobody else will, is really, uh, is really uh, important. Um, we're intended to be financially sustainable. That's not the same thing as having commercial returns, because we don't earn commercial returns. We don't anticipate that we will. But we are expected to at least preserve the value of, of, of the capital we're given. Um, there is a history in the UK, uh, under the previous government, of having all sorts of, um, of pools of loans, um, whether it's uh, um, startup loans or student loans or um, you know, a, 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 thing, uh, a fund we call Future Builders. And basically, if you're a student in the UK, by the way, for the, the repayment rate on student loans in the UK is less than 50%. So it's 
So basic no paper pays them back. And so that, so that culture of we'll make you a loan, but let's not, let's not, uh, uh, let's not um, uh, worry whether we get paid back is something that's actually quite specific, I think, to the UK. And it's a really bad idea. And we didn't, and you certainly don't build a market based on it. And we did not, um, uh, that was so, something that we very consciously uh, were set up not to do. And so, uh, and so we have this responsibility to make investments that will pay back and will earn us some, will earn us some sort of return. We're expected, as I said, to be transparent. And that's not actually, I think um, um, we've recently gone through a review of how transparent we were actually being in terms of telling people what we do. And it's funny because, you know, you, every organization probably thinks they're transparent until you really sit down and go ask the people that look at you what you really, what, what do you, what do you, you know, what information you're getting, what would you like to get, and you suddenly find actually there's a whole lot of other stuff you could be telling people. And if your responsibility is to grow the market, then transparency and, and, and that, that, that provision of data and information is, is critically important. So that's an area where I think we didn't do a good job on that we're probably hopefully doing a slightly better job on now. We're focused principally on social sector organizations, and that's, that's quite controversial in the sense, particularly here in the United States, because um, it is uh, that the spirit under which we were set up and the spirit under which we were given the money was that we should uh, connect social organizations with capital. So the equivalent in the U U.S. is that we help nonprofits borrow money or we help nonprofits attract more innovative forms of finance. We support social impact bonds. We do, we to s support to some limited extent companies who have a social purpose. But that social purpose has to be very clearly identified, has to be in the articles, has to be reflected in what they do with their surpluses. Um, so it is quite a restrictive uh, mandate. And the spirit of what we were set up was that, that we could, that there is enormous value in growing social organizations, connecting them with capital, scaling them, and providing uh, um, um, uh, more effective um, uh, interventions. Um, and then finally, we have no capacity for grants. And that's important, too, because actually every market is built to some extent on subsidy. And whether you look at the venture capital market or whether you look at the microfinance market, if you look at the, the roots of that market, you still you see a government, uh, some form of government, uh, uh, government support and some, uh, and some subsidy. And then over time, as the market develops, um, then, then the, you can, the government can uh, um, step back, which it doesn't always do very effectively. But, uh, but that, uh, that initial phase of, of government involvement is very important. We're not allowed to give grants, which probably is a good thing, because trying to mix investment and grants is always a difficult thing. Uh, but we do We have a very supportive policy environment. The, the government, the previous coalition, which is from 2010 to 2015, which is led by the Conservative Party and David Cameron, which has been succeeded by a purely conservative government, have been absolutely uh, at the forefront of leading the support of social impact investment in, in the UK. And without wishing to comment the US political system, if you're in power in the UK, you can do stuff. You don't have to ask anybody. And so you don't, and, and I'm sure there's an argument for checks and balances, but in, <laughs> In the U in, 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 in we have had now, we had a stable coalition government led by the Conservatives, and now we have a stable Conservative government. So if they say they're going to do something, if they say they're going to pass a budget, they pass a budget. If they say they're going to dedicate a £100 million pounds to social impact bonds, they dedicate £100 million pounds to, to social impact bonds. And we've been very lucky, not only that they've supported us in, in terms of our creation, but also have recognised that around the edges, there's a lot of grant support that's needed. For, to, build, to, to build this market, and that's in things like you know, capacity support for organizations who want to, be, uh, want to become um, um, uh, investment ready. Um, it's in terms of providing t the tax support, the social investment tax relief that I talked about. So that having that real alignment uh, between this sort of aspiration to grow a social impact, an uh, impact investment market with what government wants to do is a really is uh, is I think um, uh, critically important, and, and having governments that actually can deliver on what they say they want to uh, uh, want to deliver, and without uh, uh, becoming too in politically involved. Um, so let me uh, talk about what we've achieved, and what we uh, perhaps have learned in this uh, journey over the last four, uh, four or five years. I think, um, as um, Kathy said, we were launched formally in April of two thousand and twelve. Since that time, we've received about, from our two sources, about 350 million pounds. Uh, we've, uh, we've committed about 250 million pounds of that. 
Um, we've committed pretty much all of that on the basis that it gets matched by somebody, because I said we want to build a market, not be the market. So we, today we have about 500 million pounds that are available to, uh, to, UK, to social organizations and social purpose companies in the UK that would not have been available without us. And again, if you apply a sort of a 10, put it in a US perspective and apply a 10 for one sort of measure, that would be the equivalent of somebody throwing five, five billion dollars into this, into this market. You can do a, and, you, uh, and, and, and that's a large amount relative to the size of this market, just like f uh, um, uh, 500 million is a large amount relative to the size of the UK market. And as a result of that, we've had hundreds of organizations funded. Um, we've had, and when I started talking about you know, beneficiaries and actual people, there are numerous stories all around the UK of organizations that have been able to raise sort of an alternative form of finance through accessing, uh, accessing um, um, social investment. Um, there's a much clearer view of where social capital can be useful and where it, what, so what issues can it help, what issues can't it help. Um, and there's a, lot, there's a much greater sense of what type of skills you need to actually invest it. And not irrelevant for this organization, there's a whole lot more jobs available in the field uh, than there ever, uh, than there ever w was before. And so that's a, those are all um, important uh, considerations. Um, uh, but um, um, we've also um, been sort of, I guess, a magnet for mainstream organizations because main, whether, it's, uh, whether it's Barclays or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or whoever, they need, again, somebody to talk to, a central point of contact, a center of excellence, somebody that can help them. Because I think broadly speaking, in many of these institutions, there's a real commitment. There's, this, is, this is a movement with a significant amount of momentum. There's a real commitment to being involved in it and having somewhere uh, to go to who can actually not only talk to you and help you and advise you, and, uh, but can also um, uh, put some money into whatever project it is, is, a very, impor is very important. And we've helped organizations like Threadneedle, which is a big UK um, uh, uh, um, uh, fund manager. We've helped LGT, which is a big European bank. We've helped them do things that they wouldn't otherwise, mainstream investment organizations, that, that, they, uh, that they wouldn't otherwise have done. Um, we've also, as I said earlier, we provided a blueprint for other countries. That wasn't the reason that we were set up. Um, but it is um, um, very um, um, gratifying, I suppose I was saying earlier, you know, in 10 years from now, I think there will be these type of, this idea of having this social investment wholesaler, I think will be established in a large number of countries, and I hope this is one of them, uh, but a large number of countries having this, uh, you know, this, this market champion, well-capitalized social investment organizations to drive the development of this market, I think will be, will be, um, will be everywhere. We've already, we were in the cusp of, uh, um, government in Japan has approved the launch of, a, of, a, of an organization there. There's a strong proposal in Australia and Israel and other countries. So already we're beginning to see this um, development and it is gratifying to us when we look at it. They don't take everything that we've done and they probably learn from some of the mistakes we've made. Uh, but still, the basic model and the basic structure is being, is being uh, copied in a number of, a number of uh, places around the world. And there's a, m a willingness to uh, accept that it is a, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an important addition to the, to, um, uh, to, the, to the range of tools that can be used to address uh, some of these uh, social issues. Um, we've, um, I think, uh, this is important. We have bought a much more of an issue-driven focus, and I do, and I said this at the beginning, I too strongly believe that if this market is going to succeed, it has to succeed on actually addressing social issues, helping people, helping people, creating social change. Um, and I think the way you do that is not by coming with a new, let's have a SIB fund or social impact bond fund. Or, I mean, actually, that doesn't resonate with very many people. And so what we've tried very hard to do is think more about, you know, Homelessness is an issue that's an important issue in London. How can capital, our capital, social capital, be used to address that? You know, joblessness in uh, uh, youth unemployment in, in, in particular areas in the UK is a big issue. Other ways that social capital can be used to address that. Famously, you know, recidivism, 80% of first-time prisoners reoffend within a year. 
how can social capital be used to address those issues? And I think when you come at it more for, and we've written papers on the seven or eight sort of issue for areas that we, fo that we focus on, but coming at it from that direction rather than coming at it from a finance direction, I think is a really, power, is, is a really powerful, and we've tried to as much as possible uh, lead in that, uh, in that respect. So yes, we are a whole lot of ex-bankers, or, or a lot of ex-bankers in this field, and a lot, of, a lot of people who speak the language of finance. But we've tried very hard, I think, with, by hiring outside of the finance sector, but to try to turn it around to be more, um, uh, more issue-focused. Um, we stimulate the social impact bond market. Uh, does everybody here know what a social impact bond is? Pay for success? Yeah. See nodding heads. I've been, we are the largest owner, directly and indirectly, of social impact bonds. There are now over 30 issues in the UK. They cover a range of issues across, um, you know, recidivism, homelessness, children in care, adoption, the whole range of different issues. Uh, and um, and, the, and the, certainly, the UK has still w launched the first social impact bonds, still very much at the forefront of that. As I say, having an institution like ours to provide investment where necessary. Has been very has been very important in growing that market, and, and we're now at the point where we can look at a portfolio of social impact bonds and start to draw some conclusions about what the risks and returns of them might be, and that's all valuable uh, um, uh, uh, um, data if we're going to grow this market uh, long term. Um, we have been at the forefront of driving new policy initiatives, and I, I mean BSC itself is, a, I suppose, a policy initiative, and in it came from government, the social investment tax relief. Is another example. Um, we've recently launched a fund. Uh, we've recently, uh, together with a large uh, foundation in the UK, launched a, port, uh, a blended capital portfolio that blends both philanthropy and our own uh, capital uh, to address a, the smaller, if you like, end of the market. We've had uh, uh, various, as I say, grant programs to help investment readiness and create demand in this uh, uh, demand for our intermediaries. Um, we've played an important role in connecting social organizations with capital. I mean, if you are a, uh, a social purpose company or a social organization in the UK today, your choice of where to go, the availability of finance, the understanding of, uh, uh, um, uh, of the organizations you're talking to, not just about the finance element, but financial element, but I suppose the key difference is you have places to go now where people care about what it is you do and the impact that you're trying to create, as opposed to just going to regular mainstream financial organizations where they will assess you based on the credit worthiness of whatever of your, of your organization. And if you're in, if you're, if you're in the business of, create, of helping people and creating social change, you need somebody. You need to be talking to people who put a value on that. And so I think we've helped um, create that environment and create an, a, a large number of those intermediaries. And uh, that makes it, that's made it a whole lot easier for people. Um, we've helped to develop talent, and that is, um, uh, I think, thanks to the growth of, the, of this idea, there are more jobs, and I, I think we could have a, a separate discussion whether or not, for all of you who are in the business school, whether or not actually diving into an impact job is really the right, even if you want to be in that field long term, is really the right thing to do. But without a doubt, there are now probably 300 jobs that exist in impact investment in London, which the vast majority would not have exist ha have existed if government hadn't bought this money hadn't bought this money to bear and created this uh, this institute uh, this uh, institution um, and then finally as i said at the top we we are um, uh, anything you read about how you about market development and creating a market will tell you that the most important element of of market creation is this intermediary layer that's how you don't do it with just one organization at the top so we can point to a whole lot of, of existing intermediaries that were sort of there before we started that have become stronger, and, uh, and we can point to a whole lot of new organizations that have entered the field. Young people who want to start companies, whether they're investment companies or advisory companies, have been able to do that because there has been this uh, pool of capital available. Um, so that's all, and, and again, this is a very, we are very early in this journey. The idea that we, um, we've been around um, um, for you know, four years or so, um, is very er is very. It takes decades. I mean, and it doesn't matter. Again, you look at the venture capital market, um, and my uh, sort of founding partner and ex chairman Ronnie Cohen always points to the venture capital market, which is where he grew up, and he started one of Europe's largest venture capital firms, and how long it took from you know really 1970 for 30 years 
uh, to really be a significant force in, in the financial system in, in the UK. And it's going to take a long time for impact. In, in, wherever you date the start of this movement, it's going to take a long time to do that here. But, but there's no doubt that it happens because you get this proliferation of intermediaries and you get more people uh, coming, uh, more talented people, smart people coming into the field. And we've certainly um, seen, that, um, we've seen that happen in the UK. Um, so that's all very well, but let me just uh, tell you a few things that uh, I suppose we've uh, learned about this field. Um, and the first one is that we are, um, sorry. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, sorry. Let me go. Uh, no, no, that um, don't worry. Okay. Stop yep. Stop there. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, so yeah, uh, so risk and return, and look, I think this, the impact investment market is a broad spectrum. It covers a lot of different types of opportunities. I think it's, that's both a strength and a weakness. I think too often we find ourselves, I find myself on panels where people are, appear to be, you know, if you were sort of uninitiated in this field and you came in at the back, you'd come in and say that, that it was a, p a whole lot of people talking about very, very interesting, but talking about very different things. Um, so I think there is a, um, you can talk about risk and return without being pr more specific about what segment of the market you're talking about. Um, uh, and I think segmentation actually is one of the things the industry's done poorly. Um, and I believe, I know some of the foundations in the U U U.S. are working more, doing more careful work on that. Um, but I think broadly there is, a, there, is, there is a financial first dimension. There is a dimension of, there is a group of organizations that look first at financial considerations and then try to look at layer impact on top of that. Um, that is the space that arguably the DFIs have been in for a long time. It's the space where a lot of the mainstream organizations like BlackRock and Morgan Stanley and AXA are entering. Um, I think um, that idea of it's, it's, it, it, that impact investment is an approach to investment. It's about asking an additional question other than just what is your risk in return, but asking that additional question about uh, what impact does, the, does my money have? I think that's a, that's a movement that's gaining enormous um, uh, uh, strength. And I suspect that if we're here in 10 or 20 years' time, that we'll find that all of mainstream finance is asking that question and that there will be um, mandatory reporting requirements for everybody that helps investors answer that question more, more, um, uh, more carefully. But having said that, that's the financial first part of this market. The impact first part of this market, I think, is, um, is different. Uh, and where we have probably um, struck, where I think the, the financial, pr the challenge with financial first is definition, is, is what really is, OK, this is great, but we have regular mainstream ca capital markets as well. What actually is, it's all very well to say you're an impact investor, but what actually does it, you know, who's in and who, who's out, well, you, know, you can't sort of define based on legal form and so on. So I think that's a, that's a real challenge there. The challenge with the, with the impact first investment is really lack of demand. It's about, it's largely focused on social sector organizations. And honestly, those organizations don't really have um, uh, a huge demand for capital. They have demand for income and, and grants. Um, and when they do have capital, when they do have access to capital, many of them struggle to know what to do with it. And the idea of scale, which is what capital is largely used for, is not always attractive um, to uh, social organizations. So I think our challenge is really, um, again, definitionally, on, we want to do financial first investing, but we say definition's a challenge. And we've made a huge amount of progress on that. And then we are clearly mandated to do impact first investment. That's more difficult. It's probably concessionary in terms of its return, but it's hard to sometimes find you know, uh, uh, demand. Um, I think the second thing is on the measurement, and uh, um, I get into trouble when I say this, but honestly, if when I look over the last five or six years, uh, I, there's no part of the impact investing movement that, in my view, has made less progress than, me than impact measurement. And it has been talked about an enormous amount, and, uh, and uh, uh, not least sort of academically. 
Uh, but realistically today, we're not really much fur we've further along. And as Cathy said, I'm a board member of GIN, and I, for example, at IRIS, I don't know if Sarah's here too, but uh, at IRIS is, um, uh, is, a, is an example of, I think, an initiative that really has got some substance. But generally, I don't think we're really much closer to, to evaluating uh, uh, really evaluating well the impact of our investments. And you know, there are a couple of things where I think we, we're probably a little bit shy to talk about. I mean, we will never be able, there will never be such a thing as a unit of sort of impact value, like there is a dollar for financial value. Because the value that you put on providing clean water to a village in Africa uh, versus helping a young kid in East London get a job uh, is going to be different from the value that I, I put on it. It's going to be different from the value everybody else puts on it. So I think aggregating across, it may be possible, it should be possible to do a lot more within individual issues, but across issues in the sort of way that we have a, 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 a multiple issue portfolio is always, I think, going to, be, uh, going to be difficult. And the other thing I think, I mean, investors are never going to accept um, self-reported unaudited data for anything. And... Um, and unfortunately, that's what impact measurement largely is today. Um, and so until and uh, unless we can build a more uh, independent, audited, read expensive uh, a system, I think then we will, uh, it, we will struggle to find investors making, making, making investment decisions based on some um, impact uh, uh, measure. Um, I think our, our approach actually has been more focused on governance. Um, on when we uh, select who to back or who not to back, a lot of it is about deciding what the investment process is. Okay, you call yourself an impact investor. So who actually, you've got an investment committee. If your investment committee is 100% full of bankers or ex invest, it's not, who's representing impact in that sort of group? Who understands what is the, the, the issues that you're trying to fix? So I think we tend to look very closely at, at, at let's say, who's on the investment committee, who represents impact. Yes, we want some reporting. Uh, some We try to identify metrics that will give us some, some uh, measures. But it really is much more, almost more, and I know this is not terribly scalable perhaps, but it's much more about, the, about, about investment process and judgment than it is about, uh, of people, than it is about um, specific reporting at this point. Um, I think I've talked about this. I mean, it is, it is, a, um, uh, um, um, uh, it is more important to have an issue approach than it is a product approach. Issues attract people, uh, whether they're investors or any supporters of this movement. They want it, they're interested because they want to solve pr people's problems. Um, and that starts with identifying what the problem is and what the issue is, and coming in from that direction, uh, even to the most largest mainstream organizations, is always more of an attractive um, uh, uh, way of sort of developing interest. Um, I'm a big believer in hype. <laughs> I just, you know, this is one of the things where this movement has got uh, has got criticised for uh, over and over really the last five or six years. Oh, it's there's too much hype and there's not enough reality behind it. And by the way, I think that's true. There is definitely more hype and more rhetoric than there is actually real investing and real sort of people being helped. But honestly, you need hype to, to get things going. Uh, and I think the, um, um, the, I mean, we were, Cathy said we were responsible, J I say we now, I'm going to blame you as well, John. We were, sorry, we were responsible, J.P. Morgan, for doing jointly with the Rockefeller Foundation, the report on impact investing, which described it as an, an emerging asset class and put some, uh, actually not as big as we're often quoted, but still some quite large numbers. And that, I think, was an important um, um, catalyst for the growth and in interest among um, many financial institutions. Um, and I think, um, it, and everything that we had in that report was well-researched and was based on what we felt were reasonable assumptions. But I think it, it, it but it, it was, and it was, um, but it was also an attempt to sort of kickstart the growth of a market. And, and I think it got a lot of people interested that wouldn't have been interested before. And there is a point at which uh, reality catches up with hype. Uh, and I uh, don't think we're at that, actually. I mean, I think we're still, we see enough momentum in, the, in, what, in what's happening, not just here in the US, but in the UK and around the world to justify, you know, the direction of travel that we all sort of, sort of set out and talked about uh, five, or six, uh, uh, five or six years ago. And, you know, without hype, we wouldn't have the internet, and we wouldn't have had the investments that we made in the 1990s. Um, so I think what matters is where the long term, where the 
finishes where you're trying to get to, what the direction of travel is. In that respect, I think it's been very important what's happened and the amount of attention that this uh, movement's gotten over the last five or, five or six years, e whether, regardless of whether or not it's totally justified by the amount of money that's uh, gone in. Um, I think we've learned, as I said, the importance of, of definitions and particularly the importance of language. And it, one of the things that I think uh, we, you know, we all sit here in a business school, we have a certain language that we use and communicate with each other. We work at banks, we work in investment firms, we have a, a, uh, we have a, um, a, a sort of a lexicon that we use. Though I have been at so many meetings in the UK where you see two groups of people sitting down, one is more of a financial group, one is more of a sort of, more of the impact group, and they think they're talking about the same things, and they all walk out at the end of the meeting sort of really happy. That was a fantastic meeting. And then, you rea and then they realize, actually, they were talking about completely different things. They were using words. Investment, for example, means one thing to all of us. It means money we get return on. And, and it means something completely different often to people in the social sector. An investment can be a, can be a, a grant program in a deprived area which helps the people in that area get jobs or, or, or get better education or health. That's a perfectly legitimate use of the word investment, but it's not our use of the word investment. So I think we have to be really careful. And if there's one thing actually possibly, um, I'm sure you do it here, Kathy. But one thing at, at the at this sort of business school level, that sort of translation function. How do we ma how do we create people who really are uh, bilingual rather than just monolingual, which is where I think most of us uh, certainly start and, uh, and where we are uh, and where we end up. So, um, and then finally, I think on the question of scalability, you know, um, I said we have um, um, made. As Kathy said, enormous progress. It's when John and I got involved in social finance in J.P. Morgan it was 2007, 2008. Um, I don't think we ever would have expected that um, that the movement would have grown to the extent it has grown over the last uh, um, uh, um, seven or eight years. And um, and that's in or and that uh, and that sort of every major uh, institution in the world is involved. Every major business school, uh, none of them as good as this one, but every major business school has has programs on this on this subject. Is an enormous, uh, 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 I think, an enormous step uh, step forward. But if you ask about what is it that's going to really scale up this market, I honestly believe it is evidence and real evidence that that it, that this idea is changing people's lives and that it's making a difference to people. And we still haven't got that, uh, enough of that evidence. And as somebody said to me recently, anecdote is not the plural of evidence. Me <laughs> meaning that you, no amount of anecdotes necessarily are going to, are, 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 are going to uh, um, 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 uh, provide evidence. So it is this, so we need, we need evidence changing people's lives and we need to use that to change the way uh, um, companies invest, to change the way governments treat issues and they address and start to address causes rather than crises uh, that encourages nonprofits to be, uh, perhaps take more risk, be more uh, innovative um, and encourages investors to really ask in a material way a different question of what, what they're doing with their money. Um, but as I said, I think uh, uh, as as uh, Kathy said, I'm stepping down from this role at BSC at the end of the year, and then moving on to another different role, but related role at, at the Gates um, uh, Gates Foundation. And it is uh, having um, watched what's happened over the last seven or eight years. Having come to a place like this and seeing how many of people, some of the you know, it's uh, the most uh, uh, best educated, smartest, most talented business students in the United States are interested in this area, are taking Kathy's course. I think that is, and that's happening everywhere. I think that gives me um, enormous uh, encouragement that uh, this is a movement that is really, um, uh, um, and it will take decades, but will really over the next two or three decades. And indeed, that's over your business, your professional, not over my professional lifetime, but over your professional lifetime, that that will throw up enormous opportunities for you to do really interesting work and really have a, a very worthwhile and fulfilling career. I'll stop there. Thanks. Do we have a little time for Q&A? Mm -hmm. You guys have some? Do you know what the, uh, the U.S. statute is on dormant bank accounts, and how did you go about convincing the government to give you that money? Yeah.
Well, that predated me. I don't know what the U.S. Uh, 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 statute is, but I think it is. This, first of all, banks are, are regulated at state level. So I think it's, a, it's states rather than federal government who decide what happens to dormant accounts. And I think most states have swept them up into, into um, 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 sort of state coffers, haven't they? Laws and it, every state's different. In New York, it's seven years, and they publish dormant bank, dormant bank accounts, and then it gets it goes into the coffers of the treasury of the states, mm -hmm. which is much harder to get at. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I think the beauty of the UK is of course they identify this money that nobody gets sort of thought of, right? And then they identify and they grabbed it for something that wasn't just you know the same old same old government spending, and that's uh, and I. Um, um, and you know, you look at what what's happened with the money we've received from dormant accounts. Um, if that had gone into spending on the NHS, it would have been, the National Health Service it would have increased health spending in the UK by about a tenth of one percent, <laughs> and it would have just have been lost. And so, on the, so by segregating and identifying it, I think it's been uh, very uh, helpful. We've seen J Japan are funding their social investment wholesaler with dormant accounts, so they found some, and the UK are about to embark on a process of trying to find additional dormant, account, uh, dormant accounts and things like life insurance p contracts, pension funds. So in everything, it's amazing, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we didn't, when we, you know, when John and I were your age, we, uh, we, we would open accounts with financial organizations by giving them an address and a landline number. And as soon as we moved, we were lost. So unless we stayed in touch with them, they lost us. And, uh, and of course, that's different now because you all have, we take our emails with us and we take our mobile numbers to, with us for life. But, um, uh, so maybe there'll be less of it. But in our generation, there is just endless amounts of, and you talk to almost anybody, oh yeah, I had an account when I was a student and I, there were a few hundred pounds. In. And it is true that when you look at dormant accounts, the makeup is sort of very uh, um, barbell. You know, you've got literally millions of small accounts of anywhere from, not, from 10 pounds to sort of 500 pounds, that people have just sort of forgotten about because they've gone and moved and taken a different job or whatever. And then you've got a small number of very large, seven, sometimes seven-figure accounts where presumably some guys robbed a bank and got in, given them the money, walked out and got shot. <laughs> and and there's, 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 so, but there is, there is uh, it's, uh, in every financial contract, uh, there, is, um, some, um, dormant, there are some dormant accounts. And I think it's entirely legitimate to say there's some point in, in which they've obviously done in most states here, there's some point when an account's been sitting there for long enough that it should go for public benefit rather than just sitting on the bank's balance sheet or in a, or in a, or in a sort of earned fees. So I think you'll see a lot more. I certainly know in the UK we're going to make another big effort to try and find more dormant accounts. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, I know we haven't made a lot of progress in measurability, but uh, can you name maybe a few other organizations that have done a good job of measuring that you can think of uh, in terms no, of impact? I'm talking more about the general um, sort of field rather than any specific organization. I mean, I think Jin's, the work that Jin's done on IRIS is, is uh, as providing a foundation and a taxonomy for impact measurement is very important. I think what's going on with... Um, um, uh, SASB at the moment, you know, since Michael Bloomberg got involved, is a di completely different end of the market. Mm -hmm. But I think that's potentially um, uh, very, um, uh, potentially very important. Um, I think in uh, the B whole B lab movement and B corps, accredited B corps, it's a different type of reporting. Uh, but I think that's uh, we just launched B corps in the UK, uh, which and we've got now 70 uh, B corps in sort of the first wave. Uh, accredited B Corp. And again, that's something that can mean, and you've got bigger companies now like Unilever and so on looking to see whether they can become B Corps. And that's, that is, uh, that's all driven by a measurement system. So I think there is some, um, uh, there is uh, uh, some progress. I guess what's frustrating is it doesn't feel like it's a coalescing around, mm -hmm. that, around anything. Uh, and everyone's always inventing a better system, a new system and a better system. And so that's a bit, um, uh, it almost feels like um, there's a lack of sort of, you know, always want somebody to provide some real leadership, but it's such a big area that nobody, uh, I think actually in the public company world, that's what maybe SASB might end up doing. But it's, but it's yeah, it's just frustrating that, we, that it's, it's been slow. One last question. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it seems that it's, it is as much a broken system as a good cause, if you understand what I mean. 
So I mean, how much do you work with the system itself? I mean, if you have been in London, I mean, 10 minutes or, sorry, 20 minutes out uh, from the city, I mean, it looks totally different. Mm -hmm. so and, I mean, how much do you work with the impact of actually exchanging the system or just lapping the system? Well, I suppose that depends on what you mean by changing, by, by changing the system. I mean, I think we are... Um, uh, um, at least in the UK, I mean, we have a social safety net that provides help and support for a very large number of people. Having said that, at the margins of that, there are a lot of people who fall off and there are a lot of people who need additional help, which maybe the state can't provide for them. And that's the role that a lot of foundations fill. It's also the role that potentially impact investment, at least in the developed market, can fill. Um, I don't know if that constitutes changing the changing, uh, the system or not, but um, that's where we operate. Great. Thanks for joining me. Thank you.